Now, the other thing that you're going to have there, and what I'm saying is, you must be the voice that says, let's first scrub this budget. And let's take the occasion of these tough times to remove those programs that shouldn't be there before we start raising taxes. You're probably going to lose the votes when they come up, but at least you will have fought the good fight. Now, the other thing that I, I wanted to get to, as, out of deference to our sponsor, I, I've chosen the example, is where you will be called upon, oh, you've got to do some more regulation here, and you've got to do some price administration. And one of the ironic things you've already faced, I think, in 14 states with 24 pieces of legislation is this thing called interchange fees, coming from, very loudly, from the gas companies. Now, how many of you remember when you used to drive into a full service station? Oh, we got some real gray beers here, don't we? Because they almost have to be my age. But remember, they had somebody that attended the pump. They were paying that person. They had somebody that worked the cash register. They were paying that person. What did the gas stations do? If we let people do self-service and, in fact, use their credit card in the pump, we save a lot of costs. They voluntarily use, expanded their whole structure, their whole business model, to fit the use of the credit card. And they did that knowing that if we use credit cards, we have an interchange fee. You think the credit card's just out there being a good neighbor, saying they need to make a living too? Now what they've done, times are getting a little tougher. They come to you, and irrespective of the fact they have already captured the savings from changing their business model, to use this, they prevail upon you to say, to see how unfair it is for that interchange fee to be as high as it is. And unless you have, and unless you take the discipline to say, oh, wait a minute, why did you get into using these in the first place if it's that bad a deal? You can be easily seduced into thinking, oh, yeah, the right and fair thing to do. Almost any damn time a person in public office is trying to do the fair thing, they're ending up doing something bad. I think the word fair should be taken out of all government discourse. Uh, you know, because it's just, uh, it's, it's always, almost always a tip off. There's a rationale going on here. And the fact of the matter is they're asking you to do something that should be inherently and, uh, and almost intuitively contrary to what we do. They're asking you to do price fixing. Now, if you came along and said, we need to do some price fixing on gas prices, where do you think these folks would be? Oh, you can't do that. It's unconstitutional. You know, but if you do it for me, of course, it's necessary and desirable. So what you're going to face now, using that homely example, and you'll see it in a hundred different ways, you're going to face in the next couple legislative seasons, a tougher budget, a stronger pressure, let's raise taxes and we can get ourselves out of this dilemma, a resistance to closing the same old tired programs that should have been closed in the first place and probably should never have been there in the first place, and then regulate in such a way as to enhance our business advantage. You all, I'm going to leave you with another thought, and maybe this is kind of a fun way to finish because of the, how special this day is. You all know that Adam Smith is the guy who created the discipline of economics. Discipline of economics, incidentally, is intellectually and morally superior to damn near everything. <laughs> Am I correct on this? I got one vote here. How many? Certainly law. Give me that. But at any rate, uh, I always like to point out that politics, by the way, politics, not public service, not statesmanship, politics is intellectually and morally superior, inferior to damn near everything. And, and I always, people say to me, and just a, a, just a parenthetical, what happened to the Republicans in the last few years?
particularly in Washington. I'll tell you what happened to them. They changed their choice criteria by which they made decisions, what will I do and how I will behave. They changed their criteria from policy, which for about five years their criteria was governed by, what is the best policy for this country? That's a good criteria by which to make a decision. They changed that criteria to politics, which is what's best for me now? And that, by the way, is childish. It's where I call politics juvenile delinquency. So if you let politics define your behavior and your criteria of choice, you're going to end up being delinquent in your service to your constituencies, those fine people that gave you this wonderful compliment of letting you be their representative in the first place. So, you know, it always strikes me as kind of a goofy thing for me to say, telling people who hold and seek public office, this is a great deal, but just don't get involved in politics. My daddy used to say, I say, Dad, can I go swimming? He'd say, yeah, but don't go near the water. And I, I feel like I'm telling you the same thing. Here. <laughs> but have a disciplined distinction between your mind. What is the criteria of choice? What am I trying to accomplish here? Is it a policy objective or is it a political objective? And then I would say have enough self-respect and appreciation for your neighbors who gave you the job to make sure that it is a policy objective and you will never go wrong. But Adam Smith, who created our wonderful discipline of economics, which is intellectually and morally superior to everything, uh, in a book, by the way, called The Wealth of Nations, uh, in 1776, what a wonderful accident of history. The greatest book on freedom in the same year of the greatest nation living a model of freedom. I find that a marvelous accident of history. And uh, in that book, he gave what I still believe is the best definition of public service. And one that I used as my guiding definition when I got one of the things that distressed me in Washington, I, it took me years to understand what's going on here, was I'd be in meetings and I'd have people in the meetings talk about stakeholders. Have you ever had that experience? We're trying to make a law here and then, uh, well, we got to know what makes the stakeholders happy. I said, well, who are the stakeholders? Well, you know, it's either AT&T or it's the uh, R box or it's the Re box or it's the Am box or whomever. I said, what the hell? They're businesses. You make law on behalf of businesses? And somehow or another, that beguiled me. But at any rate, Anna Smith said that uh, the ultimate end of all economic activity is consumption and to the extent that the government intervene in the affairs of the economy, it should do so only on behalf of the consumer. That still stands in my mind today as the first best definition of the public interest that might guide our behavior. So when they come to you now, and they will, and they say, you know, things have gotten tough out there and we can solve my problems if you just give me this one little old regulation, I think what I dare to ask is, what does this do for the consumer? And I remember telling the folks from AT&T, and very clear, I said, you know, I really don't care how this affects you because you're not my responsibility. Uh, I thought they took it very well and gave <laughs> a lot of money to my opponent in my next election. <laughs> uh, I was just teasing you. Visa would never do such a thing. Anyway, I hope this has been worth your time, and I know I, I enjoyed it and uh, appreciate it.